Hi everyone, Gareth here. Just to let you know that if you'd like to support the production of the Music Room podcast, you can. Just head to musicroompodcast.uk slash support or click the link in the show notes. Okay, on with the show. Welcome to the Music Room. This time in the music room. I just remember so clearly him knocking on my bedroom door and just saying, have you heard this? And he just showed me Origin of Symmetry by Muse. And two very interesting things happened. The first one was, oh, crap, I can't play piano at all, can I? You know, I, I, I was playing Coldplay. I thought I was really good. And then suddenly hear Matt Bellamy playing Space Dementia and stuff. And I was like, oh, right, that's, that's how you play piano. But also then heard him play guitar and was like, oh, no, that's what I want to do. Hello and welcome to The Music Room, the show where I chat with professional composers, songwriters and musicians about what they're up to before going back in time to find out how it all began for them. There's so much to listen to now, so many brilliant guests, so much great advice. And by the way, there's rather a good item and piece of advice this episode's guest is leaving today. Uh, I'll come to that in a moment, but needless to say, have a little scroll while you're listening to this. You can go to musicroom.community and find all all the episodes there with lovely photos and show notes, or just take a look in your podcast app of choice. So speaking of today's guest, Andy Kite is an orchestrator who I'd heard of before he popped up in the Music Room Facebook group. Previous guest, Ian Arbour, go on, he has his own episode, get scrolling. (laughs) Ian Arbour is a composer who's worked with Andy for many years on some amazing productions And I thought it would be great to speak to Andy to explain what exactly it is that orchestrators do and perhaps impart some best practice tips for composers working with orchestrators. All that's coming up, but first, music stories. NME are saying the soundtrack for The Kitchen might be an early contender for one of the year's best. Directed by Daniel Kaluuya and Kibwe Tavares, The sci-fi drama follows the lives of Izzy and Benji in a dystopian future London where social housing has been shut down. The film was released on Netflix on January the 19th and Labyrinth collaborated with Music Room guest Alex Baranowski on the film's score. Yes, also in that episode list, keep scrolling. It's settled. Logic Pro is the best digital audio workstation in the world, at least according to the NAM Tech Awards. The NAM Tech Awards aims to celebrate technical achievement and design in areas including microphones, headphones, DJ technology, monitors and doors. Logic Pro didn't just win in the best digital audio workstation category. It also achieved the top spot for top audio app for smartphones and tablets. And finally, I asked the Music Room community a blankety blank question recently. The most unconventional instrument or sound I've used in a composition is thought it might uh, get some good answers. Herman, recording a fizzy vitamin C tablet in a glass of water. Then the mic fell into the glass. Oh dear. No damage done to my five quid dynamic mic. That was 24 years ago. Okay. Harry, I once did barbecue percussion for a death by barbecue scene. (laughs) Very clever. Very good. Uh, Mike, I did a very experimental album years ago and one of the tracks is made almost entirely out of an exam invigilator saying the name Smith. (laughs) I would love to hear that, Mike. Would love to hear that. Post it in the group. Uh, Dan, so many things over the years, but I did sample some bow scrapes from the metal exterior of the extractor fan where we had put in the kitchen. Ended up being a lot of hits, scrapes, and the main pad I used to score a film. Amazing. It's amazing what you can use, isn't it? Robin, metal trowel scraped across Rusty's... (laughs) Rusty wheelbarrow. Nice. Uh, Joe, a cat for sure. Ah, we're getting to the wildlife section now. Of course, Joe, it has to be a cat, doesn't it? Barry, my dog. Uh, Jim, a screechy gate in a field near my home. Very nice. Marco, my mum's cat. (laughs) Alan, badly played recorder. One take played well, other played badly for a comedic game track. Ah, nice one. Another mic. I knew a lovely Swedish lady with a gorgeous salad bowl that made long and very pure ringing noises when struck. It ended up being in a track underneath a ton of grit and distortion. 
Amazing. Brilliant. Nice one, Mike. Uh, Carol, my dog. <laughs> More pets. Rod, an owl. It's a hoot. Sorry, not sorry. Rod, you should be sorry. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. Uh, Owain did a whole film score from nothing but a recording of my washing machine on a cycle. I mean, there you go. Creativity at its best. Brolly humming through a hoover tube and squelching jelly. Love it. Claire, sugar packet. Oh, it's like a normal one now, isn't it? Relatively normal. Sugar packet as a shaker. Fantastic. Thank you, Music Rumours. And that was Music Stories. Andy Kite is an orchestrator based in London, UK. Andy has been exposed to a wide range of genres, having grown up as a songwriter and then studying classical music and jazz at university. Over the last few years, Andy has orchestrated for Joe Kramer, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation and Jack Reacher, Ian Arbor, I Am Bolt, My Name is Lenny, BBC Quacks and Eric Neveau, Intimacy, Standing Tall. His orchestrations have been recorded at Air Studios and Abbey Road in London, as well as in Vienna, Lisbon and Bratislava. Let's get into the music room and hear from Andy himself. Andy Kite, orchestrator. Welcome to the music room. Hey, thanks for having me. How are you doing today? Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Yeah, start of the week. So just trying to get admin down and all that kind of boring stuff, really. Nice one. Uh, I mentioned orchestrator there, Andy, in the intro. Mm. One side of your business is orchestrating. And so for those who don't know, what exactly is orchestrating? And can you share any kind of best practice tips with composers who work with or are about to work yeah. with an orchestrator. Yeah, sure. It's yeah, it's a very kind of like nuanced thing. In fact, when I first came out of uni and someone first suggested it to me, I, I had no idea what it was, but they said, oh, you've got a classical music background, you know, and you're looking to go into film and TV, like, why not do that? So basically, it's um, composers, they'll kind of do the demo in in their door, the director will approve it. And before it goes to a live orchestra, the orchestra needs something to read so the composer will send that door to me uh, that session uh, to me and I will essentially translate that into sheet music and then we'll kind of go it back and forth I think this is where it gets very nuanced is we go back and forth really on certain things I might have certain suggestions but just little things something that's written a bit too low for the instrument or, or is technically playable but won't sound that great you know whereas the samples obviously sort of give you a big beefy version everywhere um, and yeah and it's, so I, th- I think it's it's not quite arranging because directors obviously want a finish. They want to kind of hear the finished thing. So I don't kind of get given piano scores um, and then say, can you turn it into a string ensemble? Uh, I, I can do that. But it's, yeah, it's, it's not often kind of coming about because of the way the film industry, modern film industry is now. But yeah, it's it's really, it kind of takes a few um, sessions with a composer, a few projects to really kind of get that balance because some composers I work with uh, just know the orchestra so well that really... Uh, all I need to do is translate it, um, transcribe it, add the expressions and, and dynamics and all that kind of stuff, and we're kind of good to go. Others are less confident, so it's a bit of back and forth. Maybe I'll change the inner voicings of, of certain chords on the strings and that sort of thing, just to... Obviously, I've got to make it sure it sounds the same. I'm not going to be adding loads of random counterpoint and changing the melodies. You obviously can't do that. And then some people, occasionally I get things where someone's just played chords on a piano but with a string sound and said can you turn that into <laughs> kind of five parts which is fine it's it's you know that's that's kind of fun obviously I get a bit more um ownership over it and stuff but yeah it's I think that's I get often get composers saying oh well, so what exactly does an orchestrator do um and then I think beyond that it's it's having another extra pair of ears um on sessions uh I, I did something a couple of weeks ago with someone who'd never recorded before and I essentially I was there to kind of help run the session really and and be able to kind of give a bit of confidence to him to say oh, okay we've got that there or actually can we redo from bar 56 onwards yeah and then I, I conduct as well when we record in London and that can be really helpful to have one person in the room who knows the music really well and then a composer in the booth who knows it really well I think communication wise I found those sessions have been really good so yeah it's not the most straightforward answer um, no 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 yeah. I, I, no there was a, there was trying to pick things out of that um and one is the distinction between arranging and orchestrating which i thought you did really well in in that arranging is turning one thing into something else and i suppose you are doing that with orchestrating but it's it's kind of um turning it into the first arrangement i suppose (laughs) yeah yeah it's it is an interesting one it's a very fine line isn't it it is the the venn diagram of of um, orchestral music uh and and even going from 
orchestrator. A lot of conductors are also orchestrators, aren't they? Because they yes. know the, the yeah. music so well. So that's quite common as well. So in, in terms of advising composers who might be either working with already or about to work with an orchestrator, what kind of yeah. best practice tips could you pass on? Yeah, I think clear communication is a big thing. I think orchestrators are well aware time timings are pretty much out of composers hands and and that's mm. fine it can be clear it can be you know very rammed up to the deadline and that's okay as long as there's you know some clear communication on that i don't mind that at all really for me i see my job as being a safe pair of hands for a composer kind of help through you know that really tough period and know that they can you know with all the stresses at least i can hand that off and know that's going to be kind of done so clear communication is good i think the the session files you know i've had it where one person they sent me the session files and very last minute and the audio stems were different from the midi so i didn't know what the kind of master copy was so i just very last minute i went with the midi then i got an email back oh what are you doing you should be doing audio so okay did the audio in the next queue oh what are you doing it's not with the midi and stuff and i wasn't as experienced then i think oh god now i would just send it back and say sort it out and then send it back but um yeah i think just clean sessions really if i've got the midi to look at and then a separate stem for each let's say we're just recording strings ideally i'd like a violin one stem violin two stem all the all the pits and legato together and stuff in one stem that's fine and so ev- separate for each of the strings and then just like other so everything else that's in the queue just one more stem like i don't need any more <laughs> detail than that so yeah as long as i can kind of get in make sure i c- i know what i'm hearing then obviously i can do a good job on that um so yeah i think those yeah. are the main things nice yeah clear communication I mean, it works in most scenarios, doesn't it? As long as you're you, you're really clear with each other about uh, what's going yeah. on, yeah, then it, it should be all right. Should be all right. Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and talking of orchestrating work, you've done a lot of work with another music room guest, actually, Ian Arbor. Um, yes. How did that collaboration come about, and how has it been working with Ian? Yeah, it's it's funny actually. So I I went to uni a bit later. I went to uni at twenty four. Came, so my background is is not in classical music. My background is in songwriting and um, or playing in bands, that kind of thing. And then, yeah, 24, went to uni, studied classical music, had an amazing jazz degree at the university as well. So I studied jazz theory in harmony for three years, came out of uni, and I'd done a film uh, and TV composing module as, as part of the course. And basically just got tagged in an old school photo with a load of old school friends, one of whom was Ian Arbor, literally from middle school, like when we were 10, 11 or so. <laughs> And um, we had each other on Facebook and we're like, oh, we both do music. Let's let's hang out. And Ian had been plugging away for a good number of years, doing lots of indies and shorts and that sort of thing. And was basically on the on the verge of this is when he just before he assisted Joe Kramer on Mission Impossible. And then he's, you know, that was a great credit to have. And he's kind of gone from strength to strength there. So, um, yeah, we, we've kind of been friends ever since that. And yeah, essentially when he had his first project, kind of small budget thing he was like can you help me on this I was like yeah of course we'll do that and then yeah we've we've just done it pretty much every project together since then and it's been really i think the last eight years i think so we must have done wow probably 10 15 sessions which has been really really great yeah and recently you've released a couple of beautifully chilled songs um what prompted that side of things because that's quite different to your orchestrating work yeah i guess it's coming out of the songwriting background really i've done that for years i've played in bands for years and then I think pandemic hit and, you know, had tons of time off and thought, well, I'm really going to look into this whole indie artist songwriter thing. Let's try and make this work. And the more I looked into it, just the economy just dropped out the bottom of it. And it just was like, oh, this just isn't really going to happen as a, you know, I'm sure there are ways of doing it. But, it, you know, I kind of felt disheartened and kind of just stopped writing really. hadn't So I didn't do anything for a couple of years. And then really random artistically, uh, I've been doing stand up comedy for the last two years which I've been loving as an artistic outlet, but it's meant that doing that, doing orchestration, other bits and pieces has just meant I haven't really written many songs. And then it was actually Ian, to be honest, who prompted me. I went out to visit him in LA in October and he just said, oh, you've, you know, you must have 100 songs that you're just not really doing anything with over the years. Like, why not just record them, get them out there, maybe try and get on some library music and that sort of thing. And um, yeah, I think library music is definitely something I'm going to try and push. But for now, I just want to kind of release some songs once a month, uh, every month for this year. And um, yeah, I'm really enjoying getting back to just the creativity. Not, I don't really care how many people listen to it. For me, the success is in the the song, like I, because I've mixed them and recorded them myself, which is the first time that I 
think I've released anything that I've mixed and I'm really proud of. So um, yeah, that's been really great. It's really lovely. And, and I think it's been great to have the kind of songwriting stuff uh, still going in the background as well as the more classical orchestration. I find that if I just do one thing, I, I, I couldn't just do one thing for the rest of my life. I, I enjoy kind of dipping in and out of, of different things and yeah, doing that. So yeah. Yeah, f- fully agree. And uh, personally, I find that if you're writing, if you're working to brief, like you would be on an orchestration, to yeah. free yourself to write songs and, and just mm. muck about in the studio is Massively. really freeing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah so it's good. really good. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. It's definitely made me more excited about other areas of, of the arts that I'm in. So, it's yeah, it's definitely been a good thing. Okay. Are we ready to go back in time and find yes. out how it all began for Andy Kite? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Here we are, back in time. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it's a, the yeah. time machine. How did it all start for you, Andy? How young were you when music entered your kind of radar? In a weird way, quite old, I think. In that music was always around, you know, me growing up. Um, my dad's a musician, um, not full time, but, but, you know, just meant the instruments were around, loved singing and all that kind of stuff. But my parents didn't sort of, they weren't quick to sort of push me to to sort of play an instrument or anything. It was It was actually... And this kind of is a bit of a theme of my life, basically. I must have been about 12, hanging out with like some of my mates, um, had a really nice kind of like tight-knit group of friends, four of us, and we were just bored one day. And one of us was like, why don't we just start a band then? And like, I don't think anyone <laughs> played an instrument, but we were like, yeah, right, yeah, fine, we'll just do that. And like, it literally went from there. So I, I think we had a keyboard at home and I was like, oh, yeah, that'd be fine. Just, you know, press a few buttons, like, you know, make some music and that. You were on keyboards. Yeah, so I was on keyboards at, at the start of it and and singing. And, yeah, my dad taught me sort of the basic, you know, chord triads and stuff. And I just started writing songs. I thought that's what everyone did. And I just wrote and I wrote and wrote and wrote. And, um, yeah, you, it's kind of... Can you remember um, early on what some of those songs were about? Oh, yeah, I mean, it was it was also... Well, the thing is, I kind of grew up in, in church sort of thing. So we, we sort of had a... A weird sort of band of semi-Christian, I guess the sort of a Christian rock kind of thing, right. um, which was um, yeah, just a Did weird they, combination because my favourite bands were like Rage Against the Machine and stuff, so it just didn't really <laughs> match. <laughs> um, but we rehearsed every week for about six years, literally from like twelve till seventeen, eighteen, um, and it was wow. an amazing place for me to try out. You know, I, I wrote songs because I knew that on a Friday I could play them and we we could work them out as a band and stuff and. Um, it was amazing. Yeah, I, re- I really enjoyed that. And um, yeah, kind of really grateful for that. And I, and also, I think grateful f- to my parents that they kind of, I think earlier on than that, I did express an interest in the drums. And I think they sort of steered me away from that, which is quite sensible of them. But um, <laughs> it was very early on, steering you it, away from music. It, exactly. <laughs> oh, God. Not the drums. But, um, yeah, but I think within that, between 12 and 18, yes, I played keyboard, started by playing keyboard. Oh, that's it. And my brother, my older brother, was in a punk band. He was—I was like twelve. He was like fifteen, sixteen. And so we always looked up to them. And I just remember so clearly him knocking on my bedroom door and just saying, "Have you heard this?" And he just showed me "Origin of Symmetry" by Muse. And two very interesting things happened. The first one was, "Oh crap! I can't play piano at all, can I?" You know, I—I I, I was playing Coldplay. I thought I was really good. And then suddenly, hear Matt Bellamy playing "Space Dementia" and stuff, and I was like, "Oh right, that's that's how you play piano." But also then heard him play guitar and was like, oh, no, that's what I want to do. And so I kind of I still played a bit of keyboard and stuff, but mainly was like, OK, get into guitar. And that's really been my main instrument. Did all my grades and that sort of thing around, you know, GCSE A-level times and stuff. And um, yeah, electric guitar and um, has always been my main instrument. Obviously, hang, hang on a minute. That. Hang on a minute. You did Go all on. your grades, GCSE A-level time and stuff. That's a period of four years. So... Yeah. When you start, when how old were you when you started the guitar? So I think I was thirteen when I started the guitar. So you did all your grades by the time you left school. I think in two and a half years I did four to eight. I did every six months wow. I did a grade. Um, wow. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. Okay. It was quick. You're a man on I a think, man on a mission. Yeah, I think. But basically, what happened was is. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so I guess me and Ian met in middle school and then we went to two yeah. different high schools or secondary schools. His one was quite a good secondary school. Mine was sort of like just a, a really not great 
I I wasn't allowed to do GCSE music because they didn't have a music teacher. So oh, the, okay. the the only music teacher was on maternity cover or was about to go on maternity cover, but had also taken a sick leave or something. So they were basically just like, we're not starting on this course. And I was, well, I was gutted, but basically my parents were like, well, if music is what you want to do, we're going to get you to the point that you can do A-levels. And so I think six months before I finished GCSEs, that's when I started getting guitar lessons, like one-on-one private tuition. I think up until then, you know, friends of friends every now and then might show me a few bits on piano or guitar but mainly it was self-taught and just listening to records again and again to try and transcribe which is great for my ear um but yeah and then basically over the summer before a levels did great up to grade five theory my dad just taught me that and uh, every day we'd sort of do 20 minutes and stuff and then yeah i had a guitar teacher who just um just took me through the grades i just did one every six months and yeah just again i just sort of I was kind of on a mission. I think having the thing of not being able to do GCSE was was good in a sense because it forced me to be like, oh, okay, no one's going to give you this. Like, if you want to do this, you've got to really kind of like work harder. And I think it's, that gave me a really good work ethic, actually. So I'm quite grateful for mm. that in the end. It's, it's amazing how there's no one route. You know, some people no. would say, yes, I had a brilliant, supportive music education. And then you're saying there was no music education yeah. Yeah. available. But it's like water, isn't it? Creativity, it finds a way through. If, if you are that passionate about it, it's it's yeah. going to work. It's it's just persistence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. No, it was good though. Even breathe the creativity for making things happen, you know, in a kind of, okay, if, if you can't get it done that way, then get it done another way. And I think even just, mm. yeah, going forward from there, that's, that's been a really helpful lesson, yeah. Yeah. So you did, you mentioned GCSEs and A-levels. Did you do A-level music then if GCSE wasn't available? Yeah, I was allowed to. So I went to a different, um, co- like I went to a sixth form college uh, right. somewhere else for that. And um, yeah, they allowed me on the course. Um, <laughs> got a D. Uh, <laughs> I presume be- because of your guitar background, I presume. I, I was able to get in. Course. Yeah, I kind of showed that I had enough about me to sort of let me on the course. And it was, yeah, it was fine. I Yeah, it was all right. The music, <laughs> like I said, I got a D. I, I didn't do that well, but I, I went to uni and, and, you know, did really well there. So the hard thing with school is really you only really need to be good at one thing in life, don't you? But it's, in school, they kind of tell you you've got to be good at like 11 subjects and stuff. And then A levels, <laughs> oh, you've got to be yeah. good at four subjects. And I, I don't know, it just didn't really, yeah, yeah I, I wasn't great in school. But when I, uni was great because I kind of like found what I wanted and um, it, it kind of clicked there for me. Just I think even how to find an access knowledge was like yeah i think i came out of uni being able to even like listen to every style of any style of music and know how to break that down and that that was really yeah. helpful and stuff and i think that was yeah so really it, valuable. was it was it that kind of thing that kind of unlocked it for you what was different about a level to degree in the way you yeah, switched on to that stuff i mean a level i was 17 i thought i knew everything about music do you know what i mean I, <laughs> I was an idiot um and and also, I, I wasn't planning on... Go- the idea was I wasn't going to go to university. There wasn't the incentive to work to try and get a really good A-level result. Um, mm. And it, yeah, there were parts of it I just didn't really get all right. I think there are parts of the A-level system where you don't even have to really be good at music. You just need to be good at learning knowledge and then you can talk about a score and stuff. Whereas I think university, I went at 24, you know, I'd kind of had the shit kicked out of me in life a little bit. So you, and a bit of humility. I'd been doing music f- full time for a bit and it, it'd gone okay. It wasn't going that well. So again, you have a bit of humility. You go, okay, and then yeah, I think just a bit older, a bit more humble about it, and and twenty four, an you're a mature with, student. You want to be, yeah, there, exactly. You? You're that's it. Yeah, so there's a exactly yeah. there's a cost to going in that sense, life wise, and so you kind of like well, get in, get out, and really go for mm. it, and try and learn as much as you can, and and it was amazing. Yeah, I'd, like I said, I didn't didn't have loads of classical background before that at all, but it was it was hearing Claude Debussy and his approach to harmony that just blew me away and of, of course he's one of the great orchestrators as well with, along with Ravel at the same similar time period I mean the orchestra is just such a big thing isn't it it's so awe-inspiring and big it, it was just like god I just want to learn about that and you know if there's any way I can kind of do that then it's yeah you kind of just do the work and yeah 27 by the time I'd finished so yeah I was I was a lot older and um sort of better attitude I guess to, to learning um <laughs> yeah. but no it was a privilege to to study there and and yeah, it was great. Really enjoyed it. So, Andy, uh, I ask all of my guests to leave an item and a piece of advice in the music room for others yes. to find and benefit from. Cool. So what item have you chosen to leave in the music room? Yeah, so um, this item is um, very key for orchestrators, um, and it is a stream deck, which is um, 
Okay. I think a lot of Twitch users use them. Basically, it's kind of like, it's about as big as an iPhone. Um, something you just plug into your laptop and it's got 15 little silicon buttons that you can assign anything to. And it was an orchestrator called Henry Wilkinson, who's based out in LA, who put me onto it. And basically, he with working in Sibelius, he didn't want to have to keep clicking the top-down menu to select what he wanted. And so he basically put everything into this uh, stream deck. So now, basically, when I orchestrate, if I want to do dynamics, I don't type them in. I just click, a. have got a button for piano, a button for forte, and I just click the note on the score that I want, press the button, done. Same with um, expression marks, same with... If I want to put Soltasto above, you know, a note, you just click the button. If I want to format the parts as well, which I'm often doing for smaller sessions, again, you can just have all that in there. And it just makes orchestrating so much easier, so much smoother and just, yeah, kind of more enjoyable because you're not having to constantly click and open windows and that sort of thing. So it's a bit of a random item, but um, right. as an orchestrator and if there's any orchestrators listening, like that is an absolute game changer for me. Yeah, I, I literally wouldn't go. if I If I go away on holiday... And there's even a glimpse of a chance I might have to start orchestrating while I'm away. I'll always pack the stream deck along my laptop just just in case sort of thing. Yeah. Awesome. That's yeah, yeah. that's a little bit left field. And that's what yes. I love about this. I don't know what's coming up. And yeah. uh, this is, you know, people who actually have used these in a practical sense. So that's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, what advice then would you like to leave in the music room? I think I mean, just the obvious one of just keep going. I think it, it does get easier. I mean, if, if being a freelance musician is so hard. I was <laughs> recording cello with a, a friend of mine. She's a freelance musician. And I, and I don't think we'd actually seen her for about 10 years, but kind of through friends of friends, we'd heard, heard about what everyone's kind of been doing. And it, at the end of it, the session, I was just like, you know, it's just great to see you again and know that you're still doing music because it's it's so hard to kind of keep going with all that. But I do find that the older you get, yeah, the, the kind of easier it gets. But I think my main advice to a younger self or whoever's listening or whatever, I think it's that sort of, there is no destination with life. It's all just a journey. You don't really know what's going on. We're all obsessed with the idea of making it and that looks different to different people, but you never do. Even the most successful people I've met all kind of want to be doing something else in music. You know, they're successful in one thing, but really, you know, oh, I wish I was scoring this type of film instead of what I'm known for, which is this type of film. And I think it's just being grateful because you might never make it to where you actually, the, the place you think you want anyway. And I think just enjoying the projects that you've got as and when they come and the differentiation of projects. I've done loads of self-funded projects where I've ended up having to produce and edit, you know, whole albums by myself, which in an ideal world, oh, I would have raised more money and someone else could have done that. But actually through that, I'm now really good at mixing and my own stuff. So it's, it, that's been really valuable and really special. And then other times where you've ended up doing a session at Air Studios or Abbey Road and it's like, oh God, this is amazing. And you're like, well, it might never happen again. So enjoy it while it lasts. Do you know what I mean? Rather than yeah. being like, yeah, this is where I want to be every week and stuff. It's like, yeah, sure. We'd all love to be there every week, but might not. So I don't know. I think yeah. just enjoying the journey of it really because the reason we do this is because we don't want to work in office. It's, it's meant to be fun. So <laughs> I think we just, yeah, we often just put so much pressure on ourselves, don't we? So yeah, I, love I think that. I love that. some sort of, yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, that, that was brilliant, Andy. Um, and quite right. You know, we are in a in a rush and feel like we're missing out on things and, you know, always chasing the next thing. Yeah. So it is easy to miss things, miss the enjoyment yeah. of things, isn't it? No, definitely. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Andy, thank you so much. It's been a joy chatting. Thank you for joining me in the music room. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks for listening to the Music Room podcast today. If you'd like to know more about the show or the community that surrounds it, head to musicroom.community. The link is in the show notes. Music.